Welcome everybody back to Three Honest Lads. Mike Watts joined by a graduate of the University of Washington, then two years with the USL Sounders, into San Jose, eventually with the Galaxy, had two MLS Cup wins in San Jose, he's worked in Scouting Academy, an assistant coach in San Jose, and the fourth year head coach of Reno 1868 FC, where he's had borderline unparalleled success leading that franchise from its inception. Ian Russell. Ian, thanks for taking time and chatting with us. Yeah, no problem. Good to be here. Fourth season in Reno, you bring in young players, foreign, domestic. You bring in players from San Jose, academy guys. You find your own group of players. Describe how you guys have had such, and I call it unparalleled, but 52 wins in the first three years of a franchise in this league is unparalleled success over the last four years and what you've learned about yourself as a manager in that time. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when I took the job in uh, 2017, um, obviously I was excited to come to Reno, had an idea of how I wanted to play. Um, I also had an idea that I needed to find guys for our first team. So it was one of those where the first year I constructed a roster, which I thought there were some players on that team that could go in the MLS. Um, and a lot of them did actually. Um, Luis Felipe, Jimmy Oxford, Matt LeGrosse is now there. Dane Kelly, um, Chris Weehan got a stint. Um, so I think out of that group, there's five or six guys that went, went into MLS. Um, and as the years went by, the second year, we retooled a lot of the players. Um, you know, Danny Masofsky started playing well, Brian Brown. Um, so we've ha always had a lot of goal scorers come through Reno. Um, last year was another a good year where I think we were pretty solid the whole way through. Um, I don't think we had anybody. Actually, Danny Masofsky did. He went to LAFC. I was hoping he would go to San Jose, but he didn't. Um, but good for him. Um, and then this year has been a, a big turnover in the squad. Um, Obviously, we're playing a different system. We can talk about that later. But I knew I had to get some guys that um, could play in Matias Almeida's system that we're running. Um, so it's been a good four years. Um, you know, I do want to win a championship here. I think that's the one thing that is has been tough. I think that first year in 2017, that squad was a championship-level team for 100%. Um, we did catch some no excuses, but we had some bad injuries basically two weeks before the playoff. Dane Kelly, Antoine Hopeno, and Brian Brown, all my strikers got injured. So that was a tough one. Um, but like I said, that's part of it. No excuses. Hopefully this year we can, we can get there. Yeah, th this is a club. You mentioned Matias Almeida, and I'll dig into that deeper in a minute. But it's, it's a hybrid affiliation is what they call it. RGV has something similar where the – Sporting objectives are largely handled by San Jose. Yeah. And then the business objectives are handled by a local ownership group. So try and describe. There have been a, a couple different head coaches since you've taken over Reno in San Jose. The overarching changes to the organizational philosophy, if you could call it that, and how you as a coach have had to adjust to that over now a stretch of, of three-plus years. Yeah, so – the first year, um, I didn't have a lot of guidance on, on what they wanted. Basically, the first year, they just said, Dominic Kinnear was the coach. He trusted me. He's like, hey, just make a good team up there. Maybe I'll get some players from you. We're not really just – we want you guys to do well. That was his thought. They wanted the franchise to get off the ground with some success up in Reno. So um, they didn't even ask who I was signing. They just said, go sign all the players. Um, and I like that. That was great. You know, I could kind of cherry pick who I wanted to get to, to Reno. Um, and the second year, uh, Michael Starre came in, um, and it was a little more like, Hey, we're not going to tell you the system to play, but when we send guys, we'd like them to play. But after, you know, two or three games, if they're not doing well, let's talk about it. And then you decide if you want to start them or not. Um, so that was, that was fine. And then, um, when Matias came in, it was pretty evident there was going to be a big change, um, which is fine. I was okay with that. Um, when, when I first sat down with Matias and his staff, they sent me – well, we watched their basically their whole preseason of Chivas, 
and he's like, hey, this is the system we're going to play. We want you to do it. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm, I would be ready to do that because I've actually, what's interesting, even before Matias came, um, we had a, an assistant coach named Nick Dosovich when I was in um, San Jose that was raving about um, Bielsa. He's like, hey, you got to watch Bielsa. They play man to man. So it really piqued my interest. I actually started watching a bunch of his games. So when Matias came, I'm like, man, here we go. Like, I've been waiting for this. Now I've got a guy that really knows the system. I'm going to really pick his brain. But I did tell Matias, I go, listen, I've, I've constructed a roster to play a certain way right now. I'm a little concerned about just jumping into this man-to-man -man, um, without really even knowing it. You're showing me a video. It's like, hey, I need a little more. I want to watch you guys for a while. So he agreed. He's like, okay, let's build into it. And obviously they didn't have a great start the first five or six games, but I did see them getting better and better. And I'm like, man, this is going to, they're going to do well. This is going to work. Um, so I'd go up there every couple of weeks, we'd meet, I'd go over a bunch of stuff. I had a ton of questions. Um, and we slowly started implementing a little bit of it. Not a lot. Um, played it a couple times last year at the end of one game against OKC, where it was interesting, we actually scored three goals when we went into man-to-man, -man, so that was, and won the game. So, but we also did it against San Antonio and got ran all over the pitch. So um, at that point, Matias was like, hey, let's focus on this for the next year. You'll have a whole season. Um, so, I, man, I've studied it, studied them. Um, during quarantine, actually, I got really, really in depth with everything, a lot, very detailed. We have over probably a hundred PowerPoint slides on exactly how we're going to press teams, whatever system they're in, we will probably have a good answer for it. So um, that part's been, I mean, listen, nobody wanted a quarantine, but it was probably the best thing that, that happened to me in terms of preparing. I've never had four months where either, usually I, when, when I have time off, I'm out scouting players. I'm trying to, form a team but this is where I could really take a real deep dive into the system and um, we're feeling pretty good about it. I was going to dig deeper into Matias later but I think at this point we're absolutely jumping right in the deep end. Um, he, he's obviously one of the most creative soccer minds in forget American soccer you're talking yep. North American soccer or, or maybe even globally and you mentioned some of the you mentioned Bielsa specifically, but some of the different ways he's picked up this philosophy for you. You first hear that he's coming to San Jose. Did it surprise you that San Jose went that far in a different direction from what's been standard in MLS? And for you, how exciting is it to, to pick up a whole different philosophy? Right. Yeah, it was a big surprise. Um, but I think it was something they absolutely had to do. It was a um, the franchise was struggling a little bit. Um, I think attendance wise, there just wasn't a, a huge, I think they were losing a, bunch, a little bit of interest within the community. And I think not only did Matias bring the soccer side of it in terms of the tactics, but he's a very big name in Mexico and Argentina. So, you know, San Jose has a very big Mexican population. And I think it was a really a jump start to, I think he was the perfect guy to bring in. Um, and you talk about his soccer mind, the more I watch, the more I respect what he's doing. Um, again, I, he, you know, he gave me this, this DVD or, you know, it's not even a DVD. It's just that he's downloaded his, his preseason in, in Chivas. And when I first watched it, it's about an hour long. I'm like, kind of looking at it. I'm like, okay, they're doing this, whatever. But as you dive into this thing, you realize that every little, there's a clue. It's, it was all, it's like a treasure hunt and you pick up these little clues and then it starts making sense once you, once you get into it. And it's, believe me, when people think man to man, it's not man to man. It's, it's way deeper than that. And it's, if you just think it's, Hey, I'm chasing this guy around the field. It's, it's not like that at all. There's a, it's very complicated. It's very simple but extremely complicated at the same time. That's kind of how I would describe it. And it takes a while to get your whole team bought into it. Um, I won't say bought in it, but to know all the details of it. Um, every game's a new learning experience for us. I mean, we, 
we were doing well in it. Sacramento, I thought it was a sloppy game for us. Um, Portland was better. Las Vegas was better, but there were some things in it that we learned. And I just feel like, you know, from here on out, it's just going to get better and better. And the guys are, I mean, the guys are flying. They love it. I mean, they want to work. These guys are a hardworking group that we have. So it fits us perfectly. I, I want to dig into a couple things there. First, you, you talk about getting that initial download, that first hour of, okay, this is the new plan. Yeah. You can call it night and day or apples to oranges. What's the metaphor you would describe to say, this is how I felt about the system in 2019 going into the year, trying to pick it up versus where you are right now at the beginning of the restart? Yeah. So we would, um, you know, I'd have all these meetings with, with Matias. And then when we came back from, from quarantine, like I said, we would have these Zoom meetings with the players where we do these PowerPoint slides. We show them clips. I'd actually send the guys homework. I'd say, hey, in this press, what was good? What was bad? What would, if you're the coach, what would you do differently? And I think they really enjoyed it. They'd come back with some really good answers. And they would say, hey, why wouldn't this guy just press? And um, so that, that I think that really helped our group. They almost became their own coaches. And when we do our, our meetings, they'll, they'll jump in and say, hey, would it work better if we pressed here? Um, so they're engaged in it. They, they've totally bought in. Um, and I think you see that belief in San Jose. I think it's a system that it's almost so different that it's, you, it's like a mission. You have a mission. You need to, this is your direct mark, dominate him and the players buy into that. And that's why you see all this unity with that team and I think we're getting it as well like they they feel like okay we're going to win this duel and if we don't we still maybe have a spare man somewhere that we can use to to help but um it's uh it's been really good um and I I've told my club like if I didn't believe in this system I wouldn't do it and I'd go find another team to coach I and I would that's the truth if I didn't believe this was where I wanted to go I would just go get another job somewhere else. But I think for me, coaching wise, um, it's been really good for me. It's going to, it's another trick up my sleeve that I have in my back pocket where if I want to play this way, if I want to play a diamond, I can do that. If I want to play man to man in a different system, if I want to do man to man in a diamond. I can, um, I haven't done that yet, but, um, you can do it. It's difficult. Um, but what this is going to do, it's just going to make me a better coach. Um, and I'm, I'm comfortable. I'm, I really do feel like this system, um, if you can teach it well, you can, you can do some really good, you can do some damage with it. Yeah. Um, you mentioned something you were interested in, in having almost as a trick up your sleeve. Would you be willing in a future endeavor where you are making all the philosophical sporting decisions to take this with you somewhere. I've long felt you've twice been USL championship coach of the year finalist and you've piled up wins. I'm certainly of the belief your time is coming for, for your shot. Mm -hmm. uh, would you carry this with you as one of the tent poles of what you want to do? Or would this be maybe a, a segment or a piece? I think it would be a pretty big piece. Um, one of my main objectives when, when we play is to try to deny time and space to the opponent and what this has done is clarified that a little bit and it's made it where you know play other teams are not gonna have a lot of time and space when they play us or they're not gonna have a time and space when they play San Jose um, there's a bunch of different ways to press um, again I say this is a very simple system but extremely difficult at the same time because if you get it wrong you're gonna get scored on there's going to be chances and um, everyone has to be completely engaged the whole 90 minutes or else again, there's no, there's once you're in man to man, when that happens in the game and it may happen, you know, 15 to 20 times in a game, you have to be mentally sharp or else you're going to concede. So the question is for me, and I, I even asked myself this, I asked my staff, I said, Hey, you know, if I ever get an MLS job, the big question for me is, am I going to play man to man? And I, I, I answered my own question. I'm like, I believe in this thing. I, I think I will. Um, 
now the system may change a little bit. You know, right now we play a four three three, four two three one. Um, but you know, I definitely am a big fan of of this system for sure. I think back to something you told me before a game earlier this year. I know when a player is working hard and when they're not, right? Yep. You are, that is the non-negotiable of playing in Reno, playing for Ian Russell. And I'm interested not only because of the expectations that man marking present from a fitness perspective, but from your own background where you had to be at times the fittest, scrappiest guy in the group. Yeah, for sure. Does it carry from your playing career? Does it carry from your, your personality, from the system you want to play, the style of soccer you prefer to watch? Where's that come from? Yeah, I think uh, a couple different things. Uh, you know, I think the way I was raised, I had, a, I had parents that were hardworking. My dad worked for the post office for 40 years. My mom drove city buses for 40 years. So wow. I saw them kind of grind. You know, my mom was up at, at 2.30 every morning uh, driving buses. Uh, and my dad was just always like, Hey man, you know, he was my coach growing up until I was about 13. And he was just like, Hey, if you, if you want to do something, you gotta, you gotta just put everything into it. And he was just like, you have a gift of playing soccer. And, um, he goes, just don't ever look back and say, Hey, you could have worked harder because that will haunt you. Um, and I think my dad was nothing wrong with working at the post office, but I think he felt like he could have done more in terms of you know, just something else. And I think that haunted him a little bit. And I just think he tried to instill in me like, hey, don't look back and say, hey, I could have worked harder. So I tell that to my guys, your soccer career is maybe if you can get seven to eight years out of your soccer career, it's great. If you can get 10, that's really great. Don't play two years and stop and look back. Oh, man, I just didn't work hard enough because that will bother you. And that's not something you want to have have on your on your conscience later on. Um, so that part for sure, I think my upbringing, um, and just like when I played for San Jose, um, when I was in the A league, I felt like with Seattle, I don't know. I, I was a hardworking player. Um, but I felt like I was one of the better players on, on that team. When I got to San Jose, it was very evident really quickly. Like if I don't work, there's, I'm not going to play for this team. I mean, we had Landon, Dwayne De Rosario. Richard Mulrooney, Ronnie Eklund, man, uh, Manny Lagos, Romero Corrales. I mean, Mark Chung, uh, gosh, there's just so many. I mean, it's just national team after national team player. Right. And I needed, like, I had to work. Like, there, I was not going to – I was not good enough to just get, you know, just be a technical player because that wasn't me. I was a worker. Um, so that's where, you know, I knew where I had to fit in. And for a lot of these guys, they're knocking on the door to MLS but don't let the works work rate be the reason why you don't get there, you know, because that's, that's something you can control. You know, the other stuff sometimes you can't, but you can control how hard you work. So I think that's kind of where that, that comes from. And, you know, my job is to get guys to the next level. And if they're not working hard and I don't tell them that that's a bad job on my part because I'm actually hindering them. You know, I had Dane Kelly, I had Brian Brown where, you know, I didn't think they were working hard enough when they got to Reno and both of them sat on the bench for a while. And once they were ready to play, I mean, Dane had 18 goals, Brian had 19. Um, they won't play if you don't work. And, you know, that's just kind of how it is. I want to sort of seal the sort of the, the segment about Matias and obviously uh, kudos to your parents because that's, that's blue collar work. I mean, yeah. like that, that's the work that makes the country go. Um, in your mind, what's the biggest misconception about the Matias Almeida system? Because sometimes I'll say, okay, man marking and you go, no, it's not just that. Yeah. It's much more nuanced than that. If you could try and describe to people yeah. the biggest misconception, what is it? Yeah. I, so you, you kind of hit it. Everybody thinks, Oh, it's man marking. It's following a guy around the field. Some positions, I'll put it this way, I don't want to give a ton away, but <laughs> some positions, yes, that's exactly right. Like you have your man, this is your man, you will not pass him off. If he runs across the field, you're going with him. There's other positions, 
on the field where there will be a spare player and until that player is not a spare player anymore, you are not in man to man. The moment that guy, when you decide, and that could be a targeted player, the moment that guy is confronted and engaged, you are basically in man to man. Now, there still may, may be a spare player, but you will know where that spare player is. And once he gets the ball, there will be enough pressure on him. And then you are in it. We, you're in man to man at that point. So, he doesn't start a game like, hey, here you go. Here's all your marks. Follow them around the field. There's a very strategic plan, and it's different every single game. And it, you know what else is different? If you look at the tournament, and this surprised me because he was doing different presses that I have not seen him do before, and I've always wondered why he didn't do a couple of these presses, and he's doing them now. And I think it's he's going to be one step ahead and he's just going to keep on looking at different things. Try, I mean, some of the stuff that I saw was, in, I mean, I couldn't believe it, actually. Some of the presses that I saw, I had to look again. I'm like, did that just happen? <laughs> and that's him. He doesn't care. He and the guys will buy into it. And when they, it's almost like having a mission. Like, this is your mission. This, you're going to deal with him. And it's like almost going into battle. And I think they really, like, they embrace that. And it, if you look at that team, I mean, it's a hungry team. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm hoping, and I, I think I see that same with my group right today's session that we just had. I mean, I wanted to just give a standing ovation from what I saw at training today. I mean, they, they were just going a hundred miles an hour and it was man to man. It was, it was beautiful. I mean, I wanted to actually call Matias and say, Hey, I'm sending you the video of this because I think you would give me a hug after this session right now. <laughs> that's excellent um let, let's step away from Matias a little bit and, and even from San Jose as your role as a coach I want to step back toward your playing career you played for nine years as a pro the A-League and then in MLS how does that still inform you as a coach now the experiences you had team building the coaches you played under and you played under great ones you know, Wurzberger at, at Washington and then Megs and Yallop, uh, Kinnear, you were with Yallop and Kinnear and Mark Watson in San Jose. How does all that come together to form Ian Russell, the head coach? You know, I've, I've worked under some really good coaches, Frank Yallop, Dominic Kinnear. Um, they were both my head coaches and I actually got to work under them as, a, as an assistant coach and then Mark Watson as well. Um, so they, I would say those three coaches really – kind of shaped me in terms of of how I wanted to coach you know Frank I, I watched him he was my first coach in MLS well Lothar Osiander was but then Frank uh but I would just say Frank's just such a, a good a person a uh, really good manager of players um gets a lot out of his players and he made it very simple for me I think he knew kind of where I was as a player and tried to just make things very very simple you know and he was excellent Dominic Kinnear, um, man, the growth that I've seen from Dominic in terms of when he coached me, I thought he was an excellent coach, but when he actually came back to San Jose and asked me to be his assistant, and I, I was watching him work, and I was just looking at him thinking, man, this guy has perfected his craft. Like, he was, he was on point. Um, he drove the session, um, just got a lot out of his teams. And, um, you know, he had success everywhere he's gone. Even in San Jose, they were do, they're doing quite well. Um, and I know his next job, he'll do, he'll do a good job. And then Mark Watson, um, I worked under Mark for probably a year and a half. Um, one thing about Mark that I really took from him is extremely organized. Um, and defensively, he, he really knew, knew his stuff. I mean, I think, you know, he played for Canada for a long time. And at that point, nothing against Canada, but, you know, they're playing the U.S., they're playing Mexico, which in those times were a little bit better. So they had to be very, very defensively sound or else they're not going to get any type of result. And I think his details on the defensive side were just really, really special um, to, to the basically to the, the foot. Like, hey, your shape, you need to step this one step over here, two steps here. Like he's very, very detailed on that. And I think um, – 
you know, Mark's done a really good job. Now he's the technical director at Minnesota and, you know, they're, they're doing great. So I think all those coaches kind of shaped me. Um, they were all pretty four, four, two ish, which, you know, listen, I, I do like the four, four, two. That's what I played, but I wanted more movement out of it. So I, you know, I adopted the four, four, two diamond, um, which I played in Reno for the last three years. And it's been, you know, a great system for the personnel that I brought in there. But I would say another coach that really shaped me was Jason Christ. Um, even though I never worked under Jason, um, he was coaching at Salt Lake when we would play them. And I, I really liked how they played. They played the four four two diamond and they did it better than anybody. Now <laughs> Philadelphia is, you know, they're, they're flying with it as well. So I would say those are the coaches that really shaped me. Um, I did know going into it that I wanted to be a coach that got a lot of pressure on teams in terms of uh, pressing. And when I first started, I don't think, you know, teams were pressing, but now it's, it's fashionable because Liverpool does it so well and everybody wants to press now, but that's always been how I wanted to play. Um, so we're, we will always press. I believe in not giving anybody time and space on the ball and, um, that's how our teams are going to play. Yeah. Um, I, I want to turn a little bit to 2020 here. You guys start the season. Okay. It, it, things are going along. Shuts down in the middle of March and doesn't come back till the middle of July. You and I have spoken about this privately before. You, you spoke a little bit already about the homework you're giving players, but you as a coach, how challenging is this for you dealing with the protocols the, the change in schedule, playing teams three, four times in 12 weeks, the, the congestion of it, not knowing who you're getting from San Jose, maybe nobody is, 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 right. was the case with the bubble. How difficult is this for you? Yeah, it's, it's been really tough. I mean, when we shut down um, in March, I really did not know what to expect. I, I seriously thought we'd be playing again in, in 30 days. I didn't know how serious it was. Um, then it became very evident that, this was going to be a long-term this we're in it for the long haul. And I did not think we were going to play this year, to be honest, it started to be, you know, we'd have our zoom meetings. I could tell that the players, because every time I'm like, Hey, we should know something in another week. We should know something in two weeks. I could just see they like, it just wasn't, wasn't a great time, you know, and I'm trying to keep them motivated. Um, after a while, we had to stop talking about tactics for a little bit. Cause I think they were sick of it. And we were just talking about just life, how are things going? Um, and then, you know, we get back and, um, you know, we had to build the guy's fitness back up, but the protocols are tough. You know, we've, we've had a couple guys test positive. Um, we had to cancel a game. We had to delay another game. You see what happens with galaxy two. They have a bunch of guys. So, you know, we want to finish the season, but, there's times where I'm like, man, I don't know if we're going to finish the season because sometimes it doesn't look so promising when three teams are postponed on, on a weekend. Um, but we're trying to be as careful as we can. Um, we have a mask on all the time. Guys, when they are in somebody's car, the windows are down, the masks are on. So we're just trying to do as everything we can to keep, because it's basically like it's the teams that stay healthy not just in injuries, but without getting COVID that are going to do well, because you're, if, you know, four or five guys get it, they're quarantined for two weeks, you're down five guys. And with no help from us for San, from San Jose yet, I don't know if we're going to get help this year. I have no idea. Haven't even broached that subject yet. Um, I need healthy bodies um, because w with an affiliation, you're, you're counting on three or four or five guys to come every weekend. Now, the, the only good thing is I've constructed our team, and I do this every year, in the case I don't get anybody, are we going to be competitive? And that's how I have to always construct it. Can we win games if we don't get any help from San Jose? And this is the year where I'm like, man, if I wouldn't have done this this year, we're in deep trouble. So um, we're competitive. Um, obviously, with San Jose players, they help. Sometimes it, it throws the chemistry off a little bit the first couple games, but they're great players. And now that we're playing the exact same system as Matias, it's a lot easier to mesh them in. So, you know. Yeah. Um, 
I'm interested in this from your perspective. Uh, you're in your 40s, in good health. Do you feel safe with the protocols that have been put in place? Yeah, I think um, for the most part, feel pretty safe. Obviously, if uh, the bubble is the, the perfect thing, right? The bubble is the perfect thing. It's very expensive. I don't think USL could do something like that. Um, you did see some issues with the bubble right early on. They got there. Some teams got there way too late. That, that was the problem. You have to get there a couple weeks early, weed out all the players that have it, quarantine them, make sure the virus is not in there anymore, and then you're fine. They didn't have any more positive tests after, you know, the first couple weeks. Um, I think the USL has done a good job. Um, the testing takes a little bit of time to get the results back. I think that's the, would be the biggest concern. I think everything's backlogged in the U S. Um, I know that my wife, you know, she took a test, she's fine, but it took her 15 days to get her results. Now ours has taken three or four. Mm. Um, but you wish you could get immediate results, but that's just not, not happening. Um, but I think for the most part, we feel pretty safe. We're doing the best that we can. Um, and these are young athletes, but the problem is you don't know the long-term effects of it. And I think right. that's the scariest part for these guys. And I said, Hey guys, you'll, you'll probably be fine, but you know what? We don't know. And nobody knows. So don't mess around. Cause you know, early on we get back and, they weren't taking it serious. Guys are walking around, no mask, having the barbecue. I'm like this. So we're finding guys now with, with, you know, if they're not doing the right things that they're getting fined. And I think they, they got the message very quickly when, when two of our guys tested positive and now they're, they've, they're whipped into shape. Yeah. Uh, hopefully uh, the players who have tested positive are, are doing well. Yeah, they seem to be fine. They didn't have any symptoms, so they were asymptomatic, which is great. Um, but we were a little bit concerned that there was going to be spread, um, and that's why we postponed those games. And right now we're, it's looking pretty good. Yeah. Um, by the way, I, I need some of these team-branded masks. Yeah. Actually, you know, you know who got me was, was Kevin Partita, our, our center midfielder. Yeah? I think his aunt or somebody was making them, so – you know, even our president saw it and he was like, where'd you get that? I go, hey, you guys got to jump on this. Uh, coach, uh, a couple more and, and we'll get you back into, into preparing for your next game. I, I, all that we've talked about, all the different coaches you've played for, distinguished playing career, distinguished early managerial career in the championship. What is your long-term ambition, your goal as a coach, it could be a dream job or it could be a, a generalization. Yeah, I would say I'd love to coach an MLS. Um, any job, any job in MLS is, would be, you know, perfect for me. I think um, I would say this when I was in, was, and I've told Dominic this, I've told Frank, I've probably told Jesse. Um, when I was an assistant coach in San Jose, actually my first year in 2008, um, I was fresh off playing. Felt like I knew everything. Told Frank, yeah, I could coach in MLS. This is 2008. I go, no, no problem. I could coach in this league. After two or three years, I realized how far away from that I was. And there was way too much I had to go through to, to think that. And even, you know, I was there six, seven, eight years. It wasn't until I left and became a head coach where I, I feel like I'm, I'm completely prepared for for MLS. And that was the reason I, I did left, leave. I, I got out of my comfort zone. I was there for man, nine years, I think, eight years as an assistant coach. Mm -hmm. um, I said, I need to go be a head coach and take my philosophy and brand my team and um, see how that goes. And again, I feel like um, I would have no, I feel like I can coach in MLS. And I, I'm, I'm not going to say it's easy, but I, I have no fear of doing that. I think I'd be very successful and hopefully I can get a chance at that. How important do you think it is that guys who have stepped up before lead the way appropriately or that those guys get the time that they need to actually achieve what they're after? So I think that's been as big a problem as anything in terms of players from the championship going to MLS, right. coaches from the championship going to MLS. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's tough, right? Um, the way MLS is going right now, um, it's, it's getting harder. You know, they're, they're going out and they're hiring big time European coaches, South American coaches. Some do very well, some do very poorly. Um, I think a safe bet is to hire someone that knows the league, that's pl not even played in the league, knows the league, coached the league, has maybe gone away, stepped away, done their own thing. And at least you know they, they know MLS. MLS is a different animal. It really is. Um, but the same goes with, with the players. There's a lot of good players in the championship that for some reason don't get a chance to go to MLS. Um, I mean, there are players in the championship right now that could, could make an impact on MLS teams, 100%. I know it. Um, some of these players may have been with the club when they were 19, 20, 21, fresh out of college didn't make it and now they're cast offs. They're like, okay, he didn't make it before. That's, that's bad. That's for me. It's, uh, I think some teams need to scout more in USL and some of these guys should be getting a chance because I see some of the players that, that get on the rosters and I shake my head. I'm like, man, this guy's two years older and you're worried that he's too old because he's 23 years old now, 24. You can still have seven, eight years with your club and be good. I just – I don't understand that. And there's a lot of good players in the USL. Yeah, somewhere Jamie Vardy is smirking about that, right? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, look at Aaron Long. I mean – Exactly. Like, there's so many of these guys that uh, they deserve it. At least bring them into a preseason. Have a look at them. But don't think because they were cut from a team three years ago that they're not good enough. Sometimes they need to develop in another league. Um, to get ready. Yeah. Uh, coach, I want to finish with a game of, of word association. Maybe a name of a teammate, someone you've you know played with, coached, and, and a couple of oddballs as, as well. So a word or a sentence, maybe to, to describe each of the following. And if you choose to pass, no questions asked. So just <laughs> so if you say like a name, I'm just describing like a trait of of them or it could be a trait first thing that triggers out of your mind it could be okay. a sentence a word we're gonna see how this goes chris wandalowski goal scorer champion fighter just that's chris competitor jeff agus calves biggest calves i've ever seen on a player <laughs> steven lenhardt wild man um <laughs> A guy you want on your team, you don't want to play against him, great guy. Shea Salinas. Man, I love Shea. I, I'm, the, I'm going to expand on this one a little bit. Sorry. Go for it. I know you wanted a one-word answer, but 2008 was my first year as a assistant coach, and Frank and I went down to the Combine. We see Shea playing, and Shea, you know, hey, Shea's had a way better career than I have, but Shea reminded me of myself as a, a winger that took players on. I'm like, Frank. You got to get this guy. And, um, you know, Shea's had a great career. I know he was started in San Jose, went to F Vancouver or Philly. Both those clubs came back. I mean, what a career he's had. And he's a great guy. Work ethic's unbelievable. He's fit as can be. I think he – I don't know how old he is now, but I, he's in his 30s. Um, really happy for Shea. Yeah. Um, Dwayne De Rosario. Man, he's the joker. That guy, off the bench, starting whatever, he's going to do something magical. Um, a score of great goals. Some of the best goals you've ever seen is from Dwayne. Um, fantastic player. I wasn't sure if you were talking like true TVs and practical jokers or if you were talking like the card. No, he's the guy that you just – he can make something out of nothing. You know, you throw him in a game, he's going to score. You start he's, – he's – man, he's just – there's not been many players like Dwayne in our league, you know, um, what a player. Former teammate, current competitor as a head coach, Landon Donovan. Man, best player I've ever played with. Um, I, I think he's going to be a very good coach as well. Um, man, I, I just remember when he came to, to San Jose, I, he must have been 18. Um, his first day of training, I was – irritated because the year before we were dead last and back then they used to do an allocated player to every team 
We got Landon, had no idea who he was. Like, why are we getting this young guy? And then in training, I'm like, okay, this guy's pretty good. And that year in the playoffs, he just cared. I mean, the guy scored six or seven goals in the playoffs, five or six. Just great goals. Best player I've ever seen in, in MLS in terms of when I was playing. Like, he was, he was tremendous. A couple guys you've coached. Corey Herzog. <laughs> Corey is like the biggest little kid you've ever known. Like, he's just – he's always happy. He's goofy. Um, extremely hardworking. Um, super happy that he's had a great year here. Um, he's a leader. Like, you would not look at Corey as, like, the captain type, but he actually is. Um, good story about Corey. We – Last year, we had a player come in, um, Cade Cowell, and it was a game where um, I didn't know if I was going to start Corey because Cade was coming in. Cade was 15 years old. And what Corey said, it's, it stuck with me for a long time. He goes, I don't care if I start. Let me work with this kid. Let me help him. Let me show him. And that just, I mean, right there, it was just like, man, this is a guy I want on my team. You know, and we brought him back, and um, I'm, we love Corey. I think you guys just played against Aaron Malloy, right? Yep, we did. Yeah, yeah. the Penn State guys, they were hugging it out or they're socially distantly seeing each yeah. other post game, which I thought was cool. For sure. Dane Kelly. Dane Kelly, um, he, a gamer. That's what I call Dane. Um, what I mean by that, he came in, um, did not train very well in preseason. I'm like, Really? This is the guy that scored all these goals in this in this league. I've, I've I've scouted him. We played against Dane in the Open Cup with San Jose, and he was electric. And I'm just like, I don't see it. Um, then we start playing games, and he he lights it up. He's scoring goals. So Dane is a gamer. Um, that's how I would classify him. Jackson Yule. Jackson. So Jackson's another one. The first couple times he came to Reno, didn't have a great showing. Um, by the time he was leaving, I think it was his, one of his last games was against Phoenix. We won 4-0. Um, that's when I saw Jackson. I was like, man, this kid can really play. And he was getting used to the physical part of, part of USL. He just came out of UCLA. And, you know, he had some – what's the word? He had some toughening up to do. Um, now you watch Jackson, man. He's one of the best midfielders in the, in the U.S. He tackles. He fights. He covers the ground. His range of passing is phenomenal. Um, so Jackson's just a great player. Yeah. The city of San Jose, word association. Word association, um, expensive. <laughs> That's what I call it. <laughs> um, when I first moved, I didn't even <laughs> – it's a great city, but you need to make a lot of money to survive in San Jose when – the average price of a house is a million bucks. It's actually way more than a million dollars. Um, but it's a great city. It's full of innovation. It's very diverse. Um, and there's a lot of very bright people that live in San Jose. That's what I, how I classify that. City of Reno. Reno is an interesting city. I love it. Um, it's very small. It's the, the biggest little city is a perfect name for it because it's small, but there's a lot going on. Great scenery. Um, if you're into nightlife, there's great nightlife. If you're into fishing, there's great fishing. It's got it all. I'll put it that way. Reno's a good place. Glad you mentioned fishing. I'm getting to that in a second, I promise. Yeah. The city of Seattle. I love Seattle. Born and raised. It's a lot different than where I grew up. It's uh, – completely different, but uh, it used to be very blue collar. It's not so much anymore, um, but very pat sports. I just say sports fans are one of a kind in Seattle. Great sports town. Las Vegas lights. Well, <laughs> I think they have something that could be really good in Las Vegas. They just got to put it together. I'll put it that way. They just got to quit the wild wildness, get some consistency, and they're going to have a good franchise. Ian Russell, the player. Well, I thought I was pretty good, but I think if I went back and 
and looked at video, I wouldn't like how I played, to be honest, now that I'm a coach. Um, you know, hardworking, um, fought for the team, uh, did whatever I needed to do to try to win the game. Ian Russell, the manager. Um, feel like I'm a player's coach. Um, I demand a lot, very detailed when it comes to coaching. Um, I enjoy it. I think sometimes I'm almost too competitive. I think maybe, I think that's a good thing, but I think it can be, I want it perfect all the time. And when it's not, it's, it's frustrating, but I think there's never going to be a perfect game. So I think that's, I'll learn to kind of enjoy it more. I think I need to enjoy the whole process more rather than putting so much pressure on myself. I think that's a, that's one of the big ones for me. And you mentioned fishing a minute ago. I promised this was on here. Ian Russell, the outdoorsman. Yeah, I love to fish. I love to be outdoors. Obviously grew up in Seattle. Um, it's perfect here in Reno. The Truckee River runs right it's three minutes from my house. Um, so when I have an off day, you'll see me on the stream fly fishing. That's what I do. Is that the mascot? No. Well, truck. Yeah, truck. Truckee. Truckee. Yeah. Is that where that comes from? It is. Yeah. I guess he's supposed to be water. Um, that's what <laughs> I find, I've wanted to know the answer to that for, yep. for years. Yep. That's it. Truckee River. Uh, Ian, that's, that's, uh, that's all I got. I appreciate the time and obviously excited to see where your career takes you. Appreciate it, Michael. Ian Russell joining us here on Three Honest Lads. Follow along on Twitter at Three Honest Lads at Devin Kerr 9, at Mike Watts on air. We'll see you next time. So long. Man.